under the Tokugawa shogunate, the daimyo warrior clans are still controlling their native provinces in Japan. Okay, so really the system does not change from the Ashimoromachi period in terms of the daimyo are still in control of their native provinces. There were some exceptions where some daimyo were forced to move around or some were destroyed after the if, after siding with the Toyota movement. For the most part, uh, the Tokugawa let the daimyo control their provinces, the same ones they, they controlled before. Okay, This can't work because we know the pros and cons of the daimyo system, so something has to be done, and the Tokugawa think of a way to make sure that the daimyo are not going to disregard the Tokugawa shogunate like they did to the Ashikaga family before. They have to find a way to make sure that power is centralized while keeping the daimyo in control of their provinces. In other words, they want the best of both worlds. They want to keep the provinces organized by the daimyo, but at the same time, they want a strong centralized government. So Shogun Iemitsu comes up with a brilliant plan to organize and reform the daimyo system. First thing he does is he divides up the daimyo into three groups. So you have the first group is the Shimpan or cadet daimyos. These daimyo warrior clans are relatives of the Tokugawa. So they're cousins or second cousins that are blood relatives of the shogun. Okay. Then you have the fudai or house daimyo. And these are comprised of warrior clans who fought with Tokugawa Ieyasu at the Battle of Sekigahara in 1600. So if you were allied, if you were on Tokugawa's side from the get-go, right? If you switch sides, you weren't considered a house. Remember, he got some people to switch sides for him and fight for him. You were not a house daimyo. You had to have been on his side from the get-go um, at the Battle of Sekigahara. So most of these Fudai daimyos are in eastern Japan because that's where Ieyasu's base was, right? And the final group is the Tozama, or outside daimyo, and these are clans who fought against the Tokugawa at Sekigahara. In other words, if you were pro-Toyotomi family, you fought with Ishida Mitsunari at the Battle of Sekigahara, you were an outside daimyo. And they were mostly in western Japan. Okay, So they divide the daimyo up into three groups. And here's the kicker. If you are a cadet or a house daimyo, okay, in other words, you are either a relative of Tokugawa or you are you were allied with him at the Battle of Sekigahara, you were allowed to participate in policy making and administration in the shogun. So the shogun would ask you for advice, you were basically involved in writing policy, running the government, you were involved in all of that. Okay. If you were an outside daimyo, in other words, if you had fought against Tokugawa Ieyasu at the Battle of Sekigahara, you were not trusted at all. Okay, So they were always treated with suspicion because, hey, your ancestors fought against the Tokugawa family. What if you do it again? Right. So they were not allowed to participate in the government. Uh, spies were sent by the Tokugawa shogun to these provinces of the outside Tozama daimyo to see what was going on. And this guaranteed that they would not attempt to rebel against the Tokugawa. So basically what it does is he runs an iron ship. All the daimyo are being supervised, but the Tozama especially have a very, very, very um, strict system of being looked at but, and treated with suspicion by the Tokugawa shogun, simply because their ancestors fought against Ieyasu at one battle, okay, 50 years ago. But because of that mistake your ancestor made, you are now going to be, you and your family and your province will be considered outside daimyo for life. But it was a way to guarantee that all the daimyo are going to be brought under the strict control of Tokugawa family. Shogun Iemitsu was not content with just dividing up the daimyo. He comes up in the 1630s with a system called the alternate attendance system. Okay, And this is another way to keep the daimyo in line, in check. According to the alternate attendance system, every single daimyo clan, whether you're outside or house or even cadet, any daimyo clan, was forced to spend every other year in the city of Edo, serving the shogun. So this is how it would work. Let's say you are the clan head of the Satsuma daimyo Shimazu family, who was leading the Satsuma province all the way in the south part of Kyushu. <clears throat> so you're the head of the Shimazu family, who is the daimyo warrior family of that province. Every year, you would have to travel all the way from your province to Edo, stay in Edo for a year, and serve the shogun. Okay, you would, you know, political tasks, aiding him with, you know, setting up parties or, you know, listening to meetings, etc. You stay there a year. Then when that year runs up, you go all the way back to your province, okay, spend a year in your province, and then the next year, 
you go all the way back to Edo, spend a year there, and then go all the way back to your province. Okay, so you're basically rotating from your province to Edo and back again. And this is the processions of the daimyo. You can see um, it's not just the daimyo going by himself, taking an airplane to Edo, no. They have to, on foot, walk for the entire, basically, length of, of from wherever your province is all the way to Edo, okay? Um, and it's a big ordeal. You know, everybody goes, all his soldiers, all, you know, it's a big ordeal. And you can see the farmers uh, on the side kneeling because it's a samurai class, so the farmers who are below them have to show respect. So, you know, these were not just one person. It was the entire uh, entourage of the daimyo warrior leader a procession going from their province to Edo and back again. Also, under the system, uh, while the daimyo leader himself, the leader of the clan, had to rotate between Edo and his province, his wife or wives and children, including the heir to the, to the daimyo family, right, your oldest son, they would be forced to live in Edo 24-7. Okay, so when the lord went back to his, let's say he, the, the daimyo lord is in Edo, and then he goes back to his province, his family had to stay behind in Edo. Okay, so essentially they're like almost hostages, because while the daimyo leader can go back to his province, his family has to stay behind in Edo. They're not in jail or anything, they're, they're living in, you know, beautiful mansions that are owned by the daimyo families themselves, but in, in essence they're like hostages because they have to stay in Edo, they cannot go back to their province. So how did this system keep the daimyo in check? How did this solve the problem of the daimyo being too uh, independent and getting too big for their britches like we saw in the Muromachi period? Well, there's a couple of reasons. For one, daimyo finances and time were controlled, okay? These were very, 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 very expensive journeys, okay? You have to go every year you're traveling a lot of, of, of time, okay? It's a lot of time it takes to go back and forth. It costs a lot of money because you have to pay for the provisions of your men who are accompanying you, you know, lodging along the way, especially for some of the outside daimyo who are very far from Edo. They have to spend the most money because their journey takes the longest, okay? So it takes a lot of time and money, and so this really decreases the chances of them having time or money to rebel. Rebellions take a lot of time, patience, and funds. And if you're constantly having to move around, you don't have time to plan a rebellion, and you certainly don't have the finances to plan a rebellion. Furthermore, you know how the daimyo's family had to stay behind in Edo? They're basically like hostages. So if you are planning a rebellion as a daimyo lord in your province, let's say you're, you're there for a year, right? You have a chance to plan a rebellion or assassination attempt of a shogun or something. You don't want to do that because your wife and your children, including your heir who's going to take over your, um, your you know, the, the family one day, they're all in Edo, right? So if something happens, this family is basically going to be arrested and executed just like that. Okay, no one wants that to happen to their family, so they were basically being kept as bait to ensure that the daimyo didn't do anything. So in addition to the alternate attendance system, the Tokugawa shoguns did not allow the daimyo clans to repair their castles or to build new castles without permission from the shogunate. Okay? And, you know, there were, some, uh, for example, natural disasters they would allow, they would make exceptions. But if you said, oh, I want to make the castle nice, I want to make it new, the shoguns are not going to let that happen because if you have to, why do you have to rebuild your castle? We're at peace. What do you have to hide for you to rebuild it? What, what's necessary? Why is that necessary? So, you know, they banned construction of castles. Also, marriages were controlled between daimyo families, okay, because they were afraid that, let's say, uh, two outside daimyo families will unite through marriage, and then there'll be a united front against the shogun that couldn't happen. The shogun had to approve all marriage prospects between uh, various daimyo clans, okay. And, uh, you know, but the problem, the issue with alternate attendance, it wasn't all bad, okay, because... Everybody, everyone from different provinces is going to Edo because of this alternate attendance system. What do you think happens to the city of Edo? Well, it becomes this center of national popular culture, okay? Because you have clans from all over Japan, from the north, from the south, from different areas, different regions, different dialects. They're all now assembling in Edo, not only the leaders of the clans, but also their retainers, their families, right? 
So they're all mixing together. While provinces in Japan were pretty independent before, and you know, some people never even saw each other. If you're a province in the north and you're a province in the south, you would never see or con connect with each other. But now, because they're all converging on Edo, thanks to this alternate attendance system, Edo becomes this melting pot of culture, right? And so it really represents Japan, even though Edo's not the official capital of Japan, it's be, it really is the most representative of Japanese culture, a national culture, because you have people from all kinds of different provinces converging on this city and uh, really spreading ideas, spreading, spreading cultural tidbits, spreading their dialect, etc. And very quickly, Edo becomes the largest city in Japan, and actually in the 17th century it becomes one of the largest cities in the world. I believe it even rivals Paris in its popula in population. And it's because all these people are coming into Edo from all over the country thanks to alternate attendance. So Kyoto remains the official capital city, but Edo becomes this um, metropolitan area because of the alternate attendance system. Uh, during this period, there is this re-interest in Confucian uh, philosophy, not only in Japan, but also in China, which at this point, um, it, it's the end of the Ming Dynasty and the beginning of the final Qing Dynasty. Okay? And this is called Neo-Confucianism. It was developed by Chu Si in China. In Japan, the philosopher who was a big proponent of Neo-Confucianism was Hayashi Razan. And Neo-Confucianism as a philosophy was very popular by the, you know, among the Tokugawa class, the shoguns, and the ruling class, because it stresses social order and harmony, okay? And keep in mind that the Tokugawa shogun had just developed a new social class system, right? And Neo-Confucianism teaches that no matter what social class you're born in, you're a farmer, you're a merchant, whatever you are, you need to accept your social position in life and not, no complaints. That, that is the lot you've been given, deal with it, and you're never going to be allowed to leave or move up from that social class. So it's very conservative and it really fit in with the Tokugawa Shogunate's ideas of social norms and fabrics. Neo-Confucianism was also very, very big on ethics and morality. So just like samurai of the warrior class were taught to be disciplined and behave in moral and ethical manners, Neo-Confucianism fit in very, very well with that. Okay. And another reason that Neo-Confucianism became so popular during the Edo period is keep in mind that Japan is at peace now. Samurai really have nothing to do. They're not fighting anymore. There's no one to fight. What are they going to do all day long? So a lot of them become fascinated with Neo-Confucian ideas. And they realize how interesting it is to connect these concepts of moral righteousness, ethics, together with their own philosophies as warriors. Okay? So a lot of samurai become philosophers during this period. A lot of the best Neo-Confucian theories and papers are written by warriors, members of the samurai class. So it was very influential in Japan during this period because it supported these samurai codes of moral ethics, discipline, etc. Um, but people still had fun. Okay? It, it wasn't this completely uh, stuck-up conservative society. People knew how to have fun in the cities. They liked to ni buy nice things. But at the same time, uh, they also had this very strict moral code to abide by. 